Hello, Jeff Zwerink here. Welcome to our segment. I'm excited to talk today. We've got an AI person, Sean Aish. Uh, Sean, it's good to have you on the show today. Yes, Jeff. Glad to be here. So give us, if you will, just a little bit of background, who you are, and why should we listen to what you have to say about AI? Yes, thanks, Jeff. So I am a researcher at a, a national laboratory, and I spend uh, most, if not all, of my time uh, researching ways to apply artificial intelligence uh, to specific fields. Um, and uh, my PhD is from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and I love what I do. So I'm, I'm excited to be here and to discuss uh, AI with you. Well, good. You know, you're one of our visiting scholars and I've just really enjoyed getting to interact with you and the knowledge and uh, insight you've brought into AI. And so I think one of the big questions I know that I've had and thought about a lot, and I'm going to throw it to you, is AI good or bad? How do we think about that? Yeah, that's a great question, Jeff. Uh, so like uh, any technology, AI is a double-edged sword. Uh, just as you can use it for good, you can also use it for evil. And a great example is uh, creating life-saving drugs. Uh, there's a German biotechnology company called Evotech, um, and they have a um, AI drug creation platform that's called Centaur Chemist. And they recently created a drug that may be able to treat uh, cancer. Specifically, it uh, treats the A2 receptor antagonist, and it's designed to help fight uh, T cells, um, help T cells fight solid tumors. And they created this drug in eight months when the normal process for creating these types of cancer drugs, Jeff, takes uh, four to five years. So they actually reduce the amount of time it takes to create these life-saving drugs uh, by a fifth, which is amazing. But mm -hmm. there's also a, um, a dark side uh, to this wonderful technology of AI that can be used to create these life-saving drugs. That well, same well, technology... If, oh, if I can, ahead. before you get into the dark side, can you give us just a little bit of detail? What is it about the AI that allowed them to create it so quick? What was it doing or being used for? Yeah, so uh, whenever you're, uh, I'm not an expert in the area of creating life-saving drugs, Jeff, but uh, my understanding is that they are training it on all of the known um, kind of molecular structures, and then they are telling the algorithm, we want you to target this specific application, mm. and then using all of that data it's been trained on, uh, on those molecular structures and the natures of uh, the chemicals and what they do, it can more quickly isolate the correct uh, combination, right, of chemicals or the correct uh, molecular structure to create. Again, I'm not the expert in mm -hmm. that area, but by by training the AI on large amounts of data, and as as your listeners probably know, data is the data that uh, data is the gasoline that drives AI. Mm -hmm. So when you have lots of data, you train these large algorithms. They can often do things faster uh, than a human would be able to. Right. So, okay, so basically you've got this just enormous data set that uh, this AI that never gets tired, never needs to sleep, can just kind of comb through, find find the chemical combinations just far faster than humans can. So they, they were able to find this uh, drug that was very useful. So what's the dark side of this? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, so there's a slight uh, slight tweak there, Jeff. It's And it, it's not just searching through a data set, it's actually creating a model that is doing uh, on a data set and then it's doing some uh, um, actual uh, when it's creating the the new molecule it's using the properties of the things it found in the data set so it's a little more complex but uh, that's but actually even cooler so <laughs> yeah yeah it's really cool so uh, when we talk about the dark side and again this is this isn't really the dark side of ai it's more like the dark side of humans potentially but uh, that same uh, AI model that can be used to generate these life-saving drugs um, can also be used to create weapons for chemical warfare. And uh, there's a company called Urbina. Uh, the CEO is Sean Ekins. And one thing that he said is it only requires a small change to repurpose their company's drug designing algorithm to favor chemicals with high toxicity scores instead of low ones. Um, so the, the model is designed when it's creating a safe drug to aim to target low toxicity, because if you're going to save someone's life, Jeff, right, you don't want to give them something toxic, right. but um, all that they have to do is reverse that and tell the model, 
instead of aiming for low toxicity, now aim for high toxicity. And that same model that produced a life-saving drug could potentially be used uh, to produce uh, a chemical weapon. Now, it's not one thing just to say it's this to scare people, but it's not trivial to go from designing the structure of the molecule to using it. Um, mm -hmm. So one thing I read, you know, <laughs> this isn't something that should terrify us, but it, it is a way that AI could be used both for good and then that same AI uh, could be used for um, a not so good purpose. You know, what, what you're saying kind of just highlights, I think, what makes my question the wrong question to ask, because nobody asked, you know, is a hammer good? Uh, because used properly, a hammer allows you to construct things that you couldn't do with just your hands or trying to pound on with a rock. But now that you've got this bigger tool, if you will, not only can you do bigger, better things, you can also cause more destruction. It sounds like AI's in that class. It's a, it's a tool that we can use for either good or bad. Is that kind of what you're saying? Uh, yes, Jeff, I think that's true. Um, and so when we think about AI, it's, it's a tool. Humans can use it how they want to. The only caveat that I would add to that um, is that we, we don't have to use a tool. We don't have to create it in the first place in, in hmm. terms of artificial intelligence. And so sometimes we, we make the assumption that using AI is inevitable for some specific application. But once you create the AI, then you have to deal with the ethical issues of having the AI. Mm -hmm. So there could be situations where it might be better not to create it. And of course, that's the plot of every sci-fi movie that deals with <laughs> artificial intelligence, should we have done this? Um, and that's a, a, a true AI is a little different than this. But yeah, so I think that's the that's the only nuance I would add there, Joe. You know, it's it's funny listening to you say that because uh, you know, everybody has these questions, you know, do you want to have a, you know, a million dollars or whatever? And one of the things that I have found personally in my life is that a lot of my discipline was related to not having a lot of money, that if you don't have money, you can't buy as much food, you can't eat as much, those sorts of things. And it kind of seems like AI is in that class that it's a tool that allows us great opportunities, but it seems to require a lot more discipline on humanity's part. So, I mean, what other scenarios or what other areas do you see that play out where AI is going to require us to have a maturity or an increased level of uh, being able to handle things well? Well, another great example, Jeff, of where AI could potentially be a double-edged sword um, and uh, where it, it is art. So recently, <laughs> Uh, there was a man named Jason Allen, and he won the Colorado State Art Fairs competition in the category of emerging digital artist, but he didn't draw anything. Um, <laughs> what he did is he used a tool called Midjourney, which is an AI artist. And all that you do, Jeff, with Midjourney is you give it a sentence or some text. And there is some skill to crafting the text, but you give it the text and it gives you back an image. So all you have to do is tell this AI what you want the image to look like, and then it does the art. And this AI, Jeff, has been trained on thousands and thousands of actual pictures, and then it takes your input and generates an image. And mm. so on, on the one hand, that's great, uh, because I can now produce art. <laughs> I'm not an artist, Jeff, but... Um, yeah. I can produce art myself just by giving it some text and I can enjoy that, that process of being an artist, even though I'm not skilled enough to produce any of the things this algorithm outputs. But the dark side potentially is, is what Jason said in his article um, in the New York Times. He said, art is dead, dude. Mm -hmm. And his claim was we have AI, we don't need artists. And so this is one issue with AI is, is it going like the industrial revolution? Are we going to replace a lot of jobs? How is that going to impact humanity? How can we think about that ethically? And, and one uh, really good way to think about this, uh, this issue of, of job loss or creation is that in many cases, AI is not going to replace jobs, including artists, but artists who use AI may have an advantage over artists who don't. Hmm. Um, and so I, I think at this point in the stage of AI, um, you know, it's it's empowering us, but it probably won't fully replace us. But again, you have this kind of dual-sided nature uh, of the artificial intelligence, Jeff. 
Well, thanks, Sean. That has been really instructive. And, you know, I would encourage you to go check out uh, reasons.org and search for Sean A. She's one of our visiting scholars, has got a lot of very nice resources that help you dig into this deeper. So go to reasons.org and search for Sean, S-E-A-N-H-O-E-S-C-H. You get access to a lot more articles that help you dig into this fascinating topic. Thank you.